Big Bang. In today's creepy and slightly spooky show... The spiders will be teaching me to weave with the best of them. I should be balancing precariously with a unicycling skeleton. And we'll be meeting a dastardly villain in the strange but true story of Victorian poisoners. But first, a trick. Violet, you got a bottle of pop there? Will this do? Mmm, blue flavour. Right, your challenge is to support this bottle off the table, like that, using one piece of card only. OK, then. I reckon that if I concertina it like this... Mm -hmm. it you'll will be here it... all day and you'll never do it. Now, V, what you need is uh, a couple of bits of card with holes cut in them, like that. Just a couple of bits? Well, to be honest, you need, like, a whole bunch. Eh? Hey? <laughs> yeah. But you said that it was just this mm -hmm. bit of no, card. No, no, no. You need all those bits of card. I mean, in fact, you need, uh, like, uh, 12 of them, right? How many are you up to? A dozen. All elasticated together. Hole cut in it. Bottle goes in there like that. And with a bit of careful balancing... Voila! A balanced bottle. Wow, that's fantastic! And it's all made from one bit of card. Oh, but I still think you cheated, so later on, I'm going to scare you silly with this book. The biodynamics of the... I can't even say that. Violet, you're more likely to bore me silly with that book than scare me. We'll see. Later. My, my, Cynthia. Ernest has a lot to say for himself. Fed up with him talking gibberish? Tell him to put a sock in it. Ever wondered where sayings like that come from? Talking gibberish was invented more than a thousand years ago by a man called Geber. He was a mad alchemist, and to keep his work secret, he invented his own language. He could read it just fine, but to everyone else, it was Geberish. Gibberish. As for putting a sock in it, in the good old days before CDs, young groovers listened to gramophones. There was no volume control, so when the oldies complained about the noise, there was only one option. Putting a sock in the speaker. Spider's webs are an amazing feat of engineering. Some friendly spiders told me how it's done. Surprisingly, they told me to start off with a hula hoop and a bit of string. You take the string, put a knot in it here, secure with sticky tape, then pull it across to the other side, taut, and secure it here in the same way. Then, make a kind of a loose sideways D shape, secure at the side, and the spider will next crawl back down her thread and then drop to the bottom. The effect will look like this, with this secure, taut thread at the bottom. Next, you'll start at the side again, weave another thread in towards the centre. We can just loop it round the centre, bring it out, round to the outside, more knots and sticky tape, and then go all the way round the edge of the hoop, from here to here, joining up all the spokes. The next stage is to put more spokes in. We do this by starting on the flat bit of string, then coming down, looping round the middle and up again. And you need to make more spokes in each section, so two there, two there, all the way round. An actual spider will put between 40 and 60 of these spokes into her web, depending on how much patience she's got. Well, I haven't got much patience, so that's all I've done, because it's time to get to the fun bit. Get a load of string, weave it round a card, and then you're all set to go round each of the spokes. You tie proper knots when you do this, because otherwise the web will fall apart, but I'm just looping it round to be quick. When you get to the beginning of your thread again, go in a bit so you're spiralling round towards the centre. Of course, a spider doesn't have to tie knots. Her thread is naturally sticky. And also, it is wet when it comes out, and as it dries, it tightens up. And so, yeah, you keep going all the way round, 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 into a spiral. And you have yourself a finished spider's web with the spider's mark of authenticity. For thousands of years, deadly poisons have been used to commit dastardly deeds. 
but one particularly lethal poison rose to fame during Victorian times. This is the strange but true story of arsenic. <laughs> Around 150 years ago, arsenic was easy to get hold of because people used it as a medicine. But that's not what Victorian villains bought it for at all. <laughs> oh, my dear, you've been so kind since this mysterious illness overtook me. Yet I don't seem to be feeling any better. Do I, Tiddles? Perhaps this will make you feel better, my dear. Oh, give it to the cat. Yes, dear. It seems a mysterious illness has taken over Tiddles. I shall summon a vet immediately. A tiny amount of arsenic won't do you any harm. Just as well, really, because there are minute traces in the foods we eat. Seafood, like prawns, contain the most arsenic. But you'd have to eat tons of them before they did you any harm. So, as long as no one's adding any extra arsenic, they're quite safe to eat. As the dose increases, the victim will experience cold sweats and dizziness. They may think they have the flu, but they haven't. <laughs> Arsenic destroys your blood and mangles your liver. An overdose will kill you in a few short hours. But then, doctors might find traces of the arsenic in the victim's body. Some soup, my dear? Ew, how thoughtful. <laughs> Delicious. But the craze for this particular poison soon died out. As more modern medicines appeared, it became more and more difficult to buy arsenic. And doctors learned to recognise the symptoms of arsenic poisoning. So if anyone did it, they got caught. So the Victorian villain's favourite poison soon went out of fashion. More soup, my dear? <laughs> roll up, roll up, roll up, ladies and gentlemen. Come and see the unicycling skeleton. Ooh, this should be good. Marvel, ladies and gentlemen, as he rides his bike along a tightrope in a forward direction. Go on, let's... <gasps> go, 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 go. Ah! Be staggered at the skills of the skull with no skin as he rides his bike <laughs> backwards along the tightrope. Come on, oh! fella. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, he does all this without a safety net, for he has no regard for his own safety or indeed Why? his own life on the ground. He's a skeleton. He's already <laughs> dead. Come on, back here. Come on. Next come time on. we go, Gary. All right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, wow. You've got to hold it really, really, really tight, OK? okay. You got so, it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and just, just hold it high and he'll roll forward. Mm -hmm. The incredible thing is that a unicycling skeleton is actually quite easy to make. Whoa. The first thing you need are a pair of crisp tubes. Well, in fact, it's not the tubes you need, but the lids. They're going to form the wheel on the unicycle. Now, make a couple of holes in those lids in the centre and mount them on a kebab skewer as an axle. But uh, you'll also need to make a piece of card which is slightly smaller than the crisp lids and put that in between the two. Two bits back to back like that. Glue the whole thing together. Now, you'll need to make a pair of pedals and I've made them out of paper clips and taped them on. And here's a good tip. You see, the unicycle will run on the tightrope in this groove in the centre. And to give it added grip, take an elastic band and put it into that groove like that. Now, you'll need to make the unicycle, which is nothing more than three lolly sticks glued together. One across the top, two vertically, and on the other side, a pair of clothes pegs, which form the forks. So you mount the wheel on the forks like this. And note that the wheel needs to be really free so it runs nice and easy. You'll need to make a balance pole next, and all that is, is a coat hanger. Get someone who's good with pliers to snip it at the bottom and to straighten out the hook at the top till your coat hanger looks like that. Then glue your coat hanger in place on the unicycle so the whole thing is really good and solid. Now, to make the skeleton, you'll need some paper straws. Start off by cutting a length of paper straw and sticking a ping pong ball on the top. And then slide that ping pong ball onto that bit of the coat hanger. And you can see you've got the head 
and the spine. Have a look at this over here. Look, I've added to the ping pong ball a bit of a face cut out of card or paper. Look, all his ribs are paper straws, his spine, his pelvis is a bit of card or a bit of paper, and his arms are straws too, but my favourite bit, this is really clever, have a look. His legs, if you put a bend in the straw, then sort of clip them onto the wheel, when the wheel goes forward and backwards, his legs move, looking like he's actually driving that thing forward and backwards. You'll then need to balance the whole affair, put some heavy weights on the end of the balance pole. I'm using modelling clay. I've worked it out, Gareth. He works just like a pendulum, doesn't he? he? Exactly like a pendulum. You see what happens is, with all this weight down here, if he tips that way, then this weight is swung out a little bit further, which tips him back upright again. And I must admit, he is a bit tricky to balance, but if you get it right, he'll ride his tightrope all day. Have you got the other one? Go and get it. Why? He's a bit lonely. He's got no body to be with. <laughs> <laughs> Today's Big Bang Big Stuff is about thin bits of wire. Tightrope walking. The most famous tightrope walker who ever lived was a Frenchman called Blondin. In 1859, he announced the first of many attempts to perform the most spectacular tightrope walk ever, to cross the Niagara Falls without a safety net. I will start here in America, and I will walk to there, Canada, on this. <laughs> Basically, the principles of tightrope walking are fairly straightforward. Gravity's pulling me down, the rope should hold me up, providing I can keep my weight Directly above it. Go, Gareth! <laughs> You're gonna make it! <laughs> <laughs> and it's not very easy at all. <laughs> oh, that's a very long way down. Oh, oh. Professional tightrope walkers use a pole to help them stay balanced. The idea is if you start falling one way, you push the pole the other way, shifting the weight over the other side of the rope. <laughs> that almost worked. Oh, this will get me in the record books. <laughs> I reckon what you need is a long pole with a heavy weight on either end. That's your boot. Yeah, well, you know the size of my feet, so <laughs> my boot should be a much bigger counterbalance, because that's what's happening now. I've got a much greater weight to balance against the weight of my body. Go, Gareth! Ah. Oh. <laughs> you know what you're getting? What? Too big for your boots. <laughs> uh oh, I'm stuck. With a combination of my skills and Gareth's boots, I'm about to conquer this rope. Go on, Violet. Easy, steady. Halfway. Three quarters. Almost. Hey. Go on. Hey. Yay! Easy. Well done. <laughs> After an achievement like that, you deserve congratulations. But that's not what Blondin got when he reached the other side of the Niagara Falls. I made it! You are now on Canadian soil. Papers, please. Uh-oh. I don't have my passport. Then you'll have to go back. <sighs> Suck! Blur! <laughs> the life out of me. Got you. Yeah, but you said you were going to scare me with a book, not a spider. And so I shall. Just open it. Oh, hey! <laughs> well, he didn't scare me, but he did give me a mild surprise. He's lovely, isn't he? The key to my fluttering bat is this bit of a key ring. You just wind it mm -hmm. and it's attached to two rubber bands which are stretched across a stiff piece of cardboard. As you wind it, you're powering up the rubber band and then you can put a thinner bit of card over the top and off he flutters. He's batty. I suppose your flutter buys in your hair work the same way, do they? Get away. Let's play the skeleton. All one. right. Actually, I quite like your hair things like that. Oh, thank you. I'll bring it